welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will speak with organizations that support people of color and women in their pursuit of careers in STEM. Today we're chatting with Sarah Echohawk, CEO of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, and Tara Chaklovsky, founder and CEO of Technovation. So thank you both for joining. This is just a wonderful discussion. STEM professionals, STEM professionals that are in high demand and a grounding in science, tech, engineering, and math is a critical gateway to so many careers. So let's chat a little bit about why it's important to have dedicated programs that support STEM, STEM education for those who have been discouraged from, from pursuing STEM education and STEM-oriented careers. Sarah, could you take the first cut of why it's important to have a organization that focuses um, on uh, science, technology, engineering, and math education for uh, Native American uh, peoples, uh, and particularly given the educational history um, in this country and how, how we address that. Sure, thank you. And thank you for having me today. Appreciate it. So now, well, hello, uh, I'm Sarah Echohawk. I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. And as Mark said, the CEO of the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, or ACES. Uh, and really why ACES was originally started was because of the lack of representation in science and engineering um, for Native peoples. And uh, since then, really have broadened that mission to include all of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And primarily, I mean, there's, there's a multitude of reasons why it's important, but I would say the primary reason um, that we see it is from an economic standpoint. The, many of the fastest growing, highest paying jobs are in the STEM fields. And so we know if we're talking about issues of equity in terms of economics, that we need to have, uh, Native people need to have access uh, to STEM education and STEM uh, career development. And that historically, as you mentioned, hadn't been the case just in education in general, had been used for so long as a tool to assimilate uh, Native people into mainstream culture, really removing their culture from it. So what we have discovered at ACES is that by allowing that culture to permeate um, what people are doing in terms of STEM education and then even in their own careers, that really makes that connection back. And our people see the relevance of STEM um, in their lives and understand that there's a connection there. So we do a lot of cultural contextualization of curriculum um, and support uh, employers in how they develop their internal environments to support indigenous peoples once they're hired um, to support them in their career journey and onward. So we actually host the largest college and career fair for native people um, annually at our, at our national conference where we have about 250 colleges and universities and employers, corporations, government agencies, tribes and nonprofits who are there to recruit native STEM talent. Um, so we've been very, very successful in helping um, Native people get into those jobs, get those educations. And finally, um, working with tribes directly to develop STEM infrastructure, so a STEM workforce, um, and help them in terms of building their own tribal businesses and that tribal infrastructure there. There's so much that's uh, about education that is about transmission of information, but also about indoctrination. We see this in terms of gender roles. Yeah. We see this in terms of, of the differences in how education is unfolded for uh, people of different uh, races and backgrounds. Um, and, and basically what you're doing is you're seizing control over the content and you're determining what the content should be. Tara, you have, the, you have another um, interesting take on this because you're addressing this uh, disparity in STEM education um, for girls, for, for, for women. Uh, talk a little bit about your take on this idea of education transmitting information that is really important for careers and the whole issue of gender roles and how we should see that um, in, in, through your eyes. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, good to be on this panel with you, Sarah, and to learn about the work you're doing. Um, so Technovation's mission is to empower girls and young women to basically tackle problems that they see in their communities using the most powerful tools of the time. So 
in some sense, um, it's less about the transmission of knowledge and more of, like success for us is that young women build a sense of agency that if there's a problem, they are the ones to tackle it. Um, and it's a little bit different from, um, from really like transmission of knowledge. And I think it's, it's understanding that uh, these are real complex problems that need people to work together to tackle them. And so a big part of the competition is that they have to work in teams um, with a mentor um, from a different field. Um, and so to, and to actually deploy a solution in the real world that requires understanding of ethical constraints um, and, and really sort of from start to finish of um, real world problem solving and, and actually um, uh, seeing how your solution works in the real world. So the reason why um, we emphasize girls, and of course, a lot of it is working in communities of color and, and low is that they are really never part of the inventors club. Um, and, and I think um, I was reading an interesting article thing in the Guardian that came out a couple of days ago that said, um, most of Silicon Valley's critics are women. Um, and that's an interesting <clears throat> insight where uh, they're just not part of the conversation of creating these large scale technologies that are deployed but they are definitely users, right? And so um, there's so many books like Race After Technology, um, Algorithms of Oppression that talk about how technology um, um, doesn't serve um, minority groups well. And there's no country in the world that has gender equality. And um, the Me Too movement started in the US. So gender, gender issues are the strongest where you have the most power, the most influence and the tech sector, STEM fields are these fields that have tremendous impact and influence on our lives. And it's just, it's just critical that um, they are better represented by different communities um, and, and different uh, types of people. So that's the reason why we exist. So one of the things that I find so interesting is that the country uh, benefits, you know, this whole idea of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the country benefits when people are self-sufficient, right? American self-sufficiency, um, the whole idea of, of us all becoming uh, job creators, right? Having agency. Um, yet in our education system, our education system is predicated so often on uh, past models that uh, uh, mitigate against that. So uh, let's talk about the non-educational content piece. That, that topic that you talked about, Tara, and that you talked about, uh, Sarah, about um, the, the, the cultural attributes that you try to imbue, the empowerment attributes that you try to, um, to have your programs informed by. Um, so uh, let's talk about how that actually is transmitted. What is the initial predicate, uh, Sarah, in terms of people participating in your program. How do you start off with um, what when you inform people about what you're about in terms of the non-informational piece, but the cultural elements of what you're doing? Well, um, first off, ACES has what's called a council of, we have a council of elders um, that really are um, spiritual and cultural guiders, if you will, um, from across the U.S. and Canada, uh, who really advise us in all of our work, all of our programming and everything that we do. And that connection is made by all of the people that participate in ACEs. That's kind of the connection to culture, because often as Native people in schools um, and or in the workforce, you know, you might be the only um, Native person in your, in your school or uh, in your company. And so really having to have that connection point back is really something that ACES strives to do. And so we incorporate culture in all that we do. And it's kind of, it's hard to explain unless you've really attended an ACES event or been part of it. But um, to see that in action, maybe through education, an example would be, um, there was a class that we did in conjunction with Intel um, that we created at a couple of Navajo high schools on the Navajo reservation. Um, and it was all, 
to prep students who were interested in going into a tech career in, uh, or a tech major in college. So they were juniors and seniors. And we worked with cultural experts in the community and um, in, in, in uh, writing that curriculum, if you will. And part of that, for example, was like um, lessons around engineering were tied to Navajo weaving and the way that that is done, right? Or we did a class um, with young kids and it wasn't even a class, it was an out of school activity with kids up on the um, Cheyenne River Reservation where we did a chemistry lesson um, around brain tanning of buffalo hide. So it's making that cultural connection back so that students see the relevance in that. And so, and they understand that their culture doesn't have to be separate from who they are, what they do. Um, and as native people and at ACES, we also um, embrace TEK, which is traditional ecological knowledge and really incorporate that um, and have native led research um, presentations, things of that nature. So again, it's, it's kind of hard to, to talk about and to explain, but really the cultural piece flows through everything that we do. And um, that's where the connection comes in and why we've been so successful um, and why the organization has grown so much over the last eight years. You're doing a great job of, it, uh, of explaining it. This, this whole idea of, of how we should function within the business world, that it's not just about one thing, right? that there are cultural connections, that elders who might not have the most modern of knowledge about engineering or, or technology, that elders can actually inform what we learn. And Tara, you also made reference to this idea of empowerment, of having agency, of that cultural attribute of having agency and, and being empowered is as important as, as the, the technical information that you impart. In fact, you seem to imply that it was even more important uh, than, than just the, the, the pure data uh, that, that uh, a girl or, or a woman would, would learn. Is that how you approach uh, your, your uh, mission, that it is about agency as much as it's about knowledge? Um, definitely, and I think we all deal, I mean, these are very complex social issues that I think um, don't have just one, important um, solution, but a host of things that you have to get right is like a checklist. And I think we have a, a whole pyramid, pyramid of skills that we, we want to build on. The foundation, of course, is the technical skills, because without that foundation, like if you don't know how to read, um, it's very hard to say that you'll be able to write and, and actually contribute and share your voice. So it's a similar thing. Like it's the, it's the first step. And, but a big part of it is being able to apply that knowledge um, to real world problems and to understand, build the skills that help you. It's the journey of an entrepreneur uh, where you have to understand how do you set goals? How do you manage your time? How do you motivate yourself past a very complex, it's not an hour of code, it's 12 weeks of um, finding a problem, taking it to the market, field testing it, getting feedback, iterating, um, and, and actually being able to drive something um, into the real world where people are using it and you don't want to harm anybody. Um, and so those are all the constraints that... Um, I think school typically provide has been sort of uh, a content um, uh, delivery mechanism. And I think project-based learning um, is a way of making it more engaging, but there's still quite a bit of work to be done where you are actually um, empowering young people to tackle some of these large problems that of climate change, of, um, I mean, COVID is not just a health crisis. We know it's a justice issue. It's a health, it's a climate issue. And so those are the kinds of things that young people are going to be having to tackle in, in today. Um, and so who's giving them the skills that helps them deal with these complex issues. And to me, it's less about the culture and more about um, the right sort of sequence of skills that they need to be able to, to thrive. Um, and I think it's the underpinnings of sustainable development where, where people and the planet have to thrive together. So it, it is a series of skills that allow people to uh, employ those STEM knowledge as much as it is the STEM knowledge itself is what you're saying, Tara. Definitely. So 
Yeah, definitely. I think voice influence agency are some of the key pieces here um, that we have to keep in mind. The other thing that strikes me about the answers that both of you are giving is, is that there seems to be a community piece uh, to, to what you're talking about. In other words, there is, a, um, there is an implied obligation of, of people who have experienced disparity to heal those disparities for future generations. Is that how uh, you each see it, uh, Tara? Um, uh, in terms of your staff, are, are a lot of people um, who are engaged on your staff and your board, uh, people come out of these fields and want to see them um, uh, function better uh, for girls and women? For sure. I mean, but I think it's beyond our staff. My staff is 21 people, full-time people, but every year we engage roughly between 30, 30,000 to 50,000 participants and um, roughly half of them are students and the other half are adults, volunteers from the communities, um, educators, mentors who dedicate hundreds of hours to ensuring that young people are developing these skills. So the mentors work with the students to identify problems in their communities and together. Um, so it's a key part of sort of upskilling for these mentors too. Very few people know how to code a mobile app. Very few people know how to build an AI agent, um, but they're learning with the young people together. Um, and so it's a incredible network of supporters. And we saw with COVID, um, there's a lot of discussion around lack of access to internet and devices, which is a sort of enhance, increasing the digital gap. But what we found was that even more important was the lack of social capital, where um, the community that were able to bring these kinds of to young girls, they really, the key difference was they had incredible champions who were able to act quickly and bring these extra resources to the communities that needed them. And so I think as the conversation we talk about build back better, um, I think it has to move beyond just the tangible things of like access and let me hand you a tablet or let me give you internet access because even when people have internet access, they spend most of their time on Facebook and YouTube. They're not spending their time building and creating and tackling some of these hard problems. For us to be able to do that, we have to make sure that they have a mentor who helps them through this journey. Um, and so I think that is something where this impact is not going to happen without a community of supporters. So we just uh, completed two polls, very interesting results. We very rarely get 100% of anything in this country, but we got to 100% uh, consensus. The first poll was, do you believe that American schools adequately support all students, male, female, uh, and others, uh, people of all backgrounds and ethnicities equally in STEM education? And the resounding answer was no. 100% of respondents said no. We, they did not believe that, that there, was, uh, there was equal support for all people. And then this, the second poll also equally interesting. What do you think is the primary reason for disparities in education? And we offered uh, five or six, uh, I think five different options. Um, and we had 100% systematic disparities embedded into our education system that require fundamental change in how we educate. That was, that's very interesting. So you've got 100%, now of course it's a select audience, but 100% of, of people believe that there are fundamental changes that are required. So Sarah, let's, let, let's take that as, as a mission. What kind of fundamental, and I'm, I'm talking about our public education system, our colleges, our community colleges, um, our schools, um, what kind of fundamental changes are required in order to level the playing field from your perspective uh, so that um, your organization is less necessary to, to help level the playing field that, is, that starts off as not being leveled? Well, that's a big question. Um, I could take two, uh, two, two things come to mind. One, for at least for our population um, as indigenous peoples, our issue is always that of um, misconceptions about our population um, and our invisibility. So what happens often with our kids in the public school system or even in the BIA schools um, is Native Americans as in, in the contemporary sense are never discussed. Um, you know, if you 
go and you type into a web browser, Native American, most of the pictures that are going to come up are going to be pre-1900. And if you do that with other populations, that's not the case. So are there stereotypes around our people um, that really put us at a disadvantage? Um, there's been studies showing there's a study called Reclaiming Native Truth um, that's out there that talks about the negative impact on Native children that these stereotypes um, that are perpetuated about us and the way that um, education um, handles Native Americans in terms of our history and our political status um, is harmful to our population. So that's not necessarily specific to STEM, but that's kind of overarching what our um, population deals with just walking in the door before we even talk about, you know, education. And so then it becomes this issue of, again, of communicating, connecting with our populations and what needs to be done in terms of racial equity um, and having those conversations. The only other thing I want to, I'll add really quickly is, and I'm sure um, Sarah can talk a lot more about this, um, but for uh, Native American girls, um, Indigenous girls, uh, you know, traditionally most of our societies were matrilineal um, and matriarchal, and so women had that role. Um, and then that had kind of been usurped by the process of colonization. And we saw a real decline. And I, you know, this is still the case that in the STEM fields, particularly engineering and computer science, women are drastically underrepresented. And if you drill that down further and talk about Native American women, it's almost non-existent. Um, so one of the things that we really are looking at and working on is, um, and again, I think Sarah can talk to the, can speak to this, is starting early, 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 right? Um, you know, you want to get girls way before middle school because chances are if you wait, um, you know, till middle school or beyond, then you're not going to get them at all. So I think that's one of the things that we need to fundamentally change if we want to uh, think about this from, as an, in a, from an equity standpoint is how early we're starting and how we're teaching because certainly it's different for girls and boys um, as they get into adolescence and beyond. And so um, starting that early and, and making those um, connections is important. And that's something that, again, that we're trying to do because we see the majority of those jobs going to um, <laughs> white men, quite honestly, so. Well, you're making such an important point. You know, it's, it's very interesting to us where we're dealing so often at the intersection of various types of justices and injustice and how society functions, right? So you have within tribal communities that have suffered historic racism, um, you have also issues of gender and orientation and uh, treatment of, of uh, people across genders, right? You have within um, the community of, of women, girls, who have been systematically um, uh, 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 tilted toward not pursuing certain careers or not having certain opportunities open to them, you have racism, right, amongst different groups, right? So you have this interesting intersectionality uh, amongst different Americans in which we really do have problems to discuss with one another. Uh, Tara, when you look at, at what you do, and you made some reference to, um, to disparities that are based in, in race, people of color, and so on, um, how do you deal with these issues? It looks, it looks to me as if you, you each have tremendous intersectionality here, right? Sarah was talking about girls and disparities in girls in, in native communities. And, you know, you, you talk about girls and then you also talk about uh, disparities, people of color amongst uh, girls that you are supporting. How do you um, ensure that you're trying to deal with the intersectional elements here? Um, is it more about discussion? Is it about the, the staff that you employ? Is it about um, the communities that you serve? How do you, how do you deal with that from a strategic uh, point of view? Um, I think, so we've been running for 15 years and I've learned quite a bit because we get most of our funding from the STEM industry. And, in, and I'm learning that um, I think a big problem is sort of the capitalistic um, framework is you have one one metric that you're optimizing for, right? Like it's your bottom line number. Profit. And 
prof profit or just one number because we we want to be we want to simplify our systems uh funders give you a grant and they say okay what's your metric of success here are your kpis and that kind of framework doesn't really fit in a prop with, with complex social problems that have multiple feedback loops at multiple time cycles. So it's not just- I see Sarah is smiling here about, about your point, right? You, I, I suspect we have violent agreement, right, Sarah? Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, and I think, um, so for us, it's never about, I, I think that was the technovation model where um, you have a whole community and multiple impacts and metrics of successes. And a very common point of feedback, there would be two things that would come back. You lack focus. And second, that your, your approach is very hard to understand because it is not just teaching girls how to code. That we can understand, but you are saying, oh, you're going to uh, train parents, you're going to build capacity with mentors, you're going to help them teach real world problems. And coding is just one part of it. And so people have a hard time understanding that. But guess what? That's what makes impact. And now we have 10 years sort of look back data to show that what happens to these young women when 10 years after the program and turns out 76% of them are pursuing STEM degrees, 60% of them are actually in STEM careers uh, because this, this multifaceted approach was something that really uh, stuck with them. And, and so... I think my my main point of feedback would be for complex social problems that have have been with us for many years. We need complex multidimensional solutions, and so you got to stop saying what is the silver bullet that we need. So I will end with that. So so that intersectionality answer is is you're you're saying it's not just one thing. It's involving the entire community. Sarah, uh, do you basically take that same approach? Yes, most, most definitely. Um, teachers, and that's another thing, we need more uh, Indigenous teachers, <laughs> for sure. But yeah, entire communities, a community-based approach. Um, you know, you have to have, in order to have healthy kids, you have to have healthy communities and healthy families. So certainly that's part of it. And, and why I think also, you know, employers often um, are surprised when they hire Indigenous um, people to work in their companies, because they are used to working in a setting where it's about community and not about individual achievement. So they're very good team players and also uh, think differently, I guess I would say from uh, coming out of the, uh, the, the reservation, other places that uh, native people come from and into the workforce. But on the intersectionality piece, I do think it's important. And one of the things that, uh, that we do is we, you know, we're in a number of coalitions with, you know, the National Society of Black Engineers and Hispanic Professional Engineers and uh, women engineers and others where we work together um, and try to find commonalities and things, pro take on projects because we recognize as a group or when we work together that uh, as Tara was talking about with funders, um, it's easier to uh, get support, I guess, when we're working together and you know can present more of a cohesive picture um, and address intersectionality. Um, and on that note, there I'm actually on a committee, and there'll be a report coming out of the National Academies, um, hopefully later this year, that we've been working on about women of color in tech. And so, um, and that really is looking at intersexuality and what what needs to happen for women of color to be successful in tech. So, so the people we with for that are the Anita Board uh, folks. Uh, we recruited Brenda Darden Wilkerson uh, to them, and as well as their CIO. Um, they are just an amazing organization. It's the largest uh, uh, organization of women in technology globally, uh, and uh, just just phenomenal. I'm sure they will be uh, great supporters of uh, of yours. Um, I did want to just uh, mention that we we just uh, completed a third poll, and we're going to come to the end of our time now. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to give you each a bite at the apple to close us off. Um, but the, the poll was how important to business success, business success is ethnic and gender diversity in the STEM workforce. 92% of respondents said very important, 8% um, said somewhat important, but there does seem to be uh, a huge consensus uh, on this. How do we uh, change in the, in the future this dynamic? It seems that uh, you each have been doing the, your work for a long period of time. Um, 
the change is not a light switch. You can't just turn change on. But we do need to accelerate the pace of change. If you were to each give us one thing that we should change about all of our behaviors, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of orientation, what is the one thing that we should do to change ourselves in order to speed change for society? So let's let's start off with uh, with uh, uh, Sarah, and then we'll give Tara the last word. Sarah, wh- what is the one thing that I need to change about myself to help you and your mission? Well, I don't know if you need to change because I don't know where you stand on this, but I will say, um, I think what we need to do is shift our thinking um, collectively. In that, um, a lot of times we're viewed as charity or right? This is something, oh, we should hire X number of Native Americans and X number of women and X number of Hispanics or whatever. We should make sure they have equal opportunity because it's the right thing to do Um, rather than seeing that as being um, something that's positive and something that's good and something that will actually help our country thrive. So businesses do better when they have diverse teams. So I think shifting our mindset that it's not something that we're doing to help this poor community, but really understanding that this is something that we should be doing because it's for it's for the good of all of us and that it will benefit all of us. And so that's a fundamental shift in the way that you work with people and the way you treat people when you work with them, work with people of color, right? Is that it's not parity. It's not I'm trying to be do something good. It's more like I'm recognizing the value in these people. You're also trying to help the country and your business, and your neighbor, right? In the way that we should be doing, right? It's, exactly. it's, 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 it's no different. It's listening to a need, trying to convey, making a contribution, and then having a benefit yourself, right? From, from having someone who is educated, from somebody who, c- who can help you, who can help right. you understand the word better, the world better. Tara, what is the one thing that I need to do t- in your mind in myself? What is the thing that I need to, to evolve in me to help you in your mission? I think I was I was say what Sarah said. I don't know where you stand, Mark, but I think one thing I learned um, reading Nelson Mandela's book, which is, was very, very interesting insight, was that um, most of us have been brought up on, um, on the literature of white people. Um, and, and to begin to slowly change our minds and to be open um, to a different way of thinking, we've got to read the books of different communities and their literature because it's beyond social media. We're just reading, even going through some sort of unconscious bias training is not, there's no training that has documented evidence that it works, right? Like these are deeply seated ideas that we have. And the only way to sort of change them is by spending time thinking in and, and reading is one of the best ways, like reading actual books by uh, different native communities, but also communities that are marginalized. There's amazing literature out there. And that's how you s- sort of build these stories and narratives in your head that you can reach into when um, you're trying to convince yourself of a different point of view. So I've been doing that and I've found that it's, it's actually not so as it would seem um, much faster than not doing it. You know, I think you both know where I stand, but I, but, but I want to be serious for a moment. Um, no matter where you stand, um, learning is a continual um, uh, process of self-correction, of, of becoming more knowledgeable and evolving uh, your views. I, I think that, that part of, of my answer to, to that question is that we need to constantly listen. And this is part of my meditation. I wanna thank you both for helping us understand a little bit more about uh, your worlds, the communities that you serve, and perhaps allowing us to be a little bit, um, not only more informed, but also more part of the solutions that you provide for society. Uh, Sarah Ethelhawk um, of the uh, of, uh, ISIS, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, and Tara, and Tara Chaklovsky, um, founder and CEO of Technovation. Thank you so much for sharing your work. That's the nonprofit report. Participants, thank you so much for coming. Uh, please tell your friends. 
And uh, we'll see you on Thursday where we'll be talking about uh, gun violence and how we can stop it in, in America. Have a great day. Take care.